welcome to our final conversation uh, in the AI Lounge. We've had a whole week now of conversations about issues that may be troubling you or interesting you in AI. And most of the week we've been doing, the panel up the front has been doing the talking. And we wanted to give you an opportunity to um, ask all the questions about anything really in AI that might be interesting you or troubling you. So um, I'm just going to kick the things off, warm things up by asking a couple of questions and then uh, we're going to open it to the floor and I'm hoping you've got lots of questions to, to uh, try, test our very knowledgeable and eminent panelists. So let me introduce them to you. Um, Immediately next to me is Devi Parikh. She, I, we should be very thankful that she's here. She just literally got off the plane this morning from, from the United States. Her plane had been delayed two days? One day. One day, one day. Yeah. So um, she hasn't yet been to bed. So if she falls asleep, <laughs> I'll just gently prod her. We pretend we didn't see anything, okay? Uh, she's uh, uh, a professor in computer science at uh, Georgia Tech, and also she has a half-time position at, at Facebook Research uh, in their AI research group fair in Menlo Park. We're also incredibly lucky. She is one of the up-and-coming up rising stars in AI. Uh, earlier this afternoon, she picked up the prize for the most promising up-and-coming uh, researcher in AI at the Ichikai, the main AI conference across the road. This is the Computers and Thought Award. And then furthest away from me, again, we're immensely lucky. Um, to have Thomas Sandholm, he's also a professor of computer science at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. You may have seen him in the newspapers earlier this year when Libratus, his poker playing bot, beat some of the world's best experts at playing poker. He's also made a huge number of con contributions in other areas of AI, in combinatorial auctions, uh, in kidney exchange, many other things. And so he's had a lot of experience. He's started up a couple, couple of companies now? Three. Three, yes. I'm losing count of any. And, interestingly enough, I don't know if they spotted the connection yet, he also, when he was much younger, was the winner of the Computers and Thought Award. So he was, when he was younger, recognized as an up-and-coming star, and he now is one of those rising stars. So join with me in welcoming our expert panel. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so to begin, I just uh, I thought I'd warm you up by asking a couple of questions. So... We keep on opening the newspapers and it seems like AI is coming quickly, but how long before we have machines that are really as smart as us? Who wants to start? I can take a stab at it. Um, I, I actually don't know how to answer that question, um, partly because I think it's hard to even know what it means to meet um, human level intelligence. I don't know how to define it. I don't know how to measure it. So I don't know how we would know even if we've gotten there. Um, and I think the other thing is that... Could, could we just apply Turing's test? <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's going to measure um, some, a particular kind of intelligence, and there are ways to so sort just, of... Just for anyone who doesn't know what Turing, the Turing test is, Alan Turing, who was one of the fathers of AI, proposed a thought experiment more than a real experiment, I think. You, you're probably going to agree, I hope. That we could actually just talk to a machine through a terminal so you couldn't see it was a machine and talk to a human and if you after asking questions you couldn't work out who was the machine and who was the computer then maybe you could say that was what it was to have a machine that could think and on this panel one of the panelists is a robot and you have to figure out which one <laughs> <laughs> don't be fooled by trick answers like that <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, there are ways of gaming something like that, where if you give it a math question, then the computer intentionally slows down to give a slower response because we know humans can't do it as fast. And so there's funniness involved in um, doing something like that. I think another issue also is that um, AI seems to be a bit of a moving target. Once we have machines that can solve a particular task well, we start thinking, oh, no, that wasn't really AI. That's just a search algorithm. And things like that. So I think it's also a little bit of that issue, that whatever we do accomplish, we think that, oh, that wasn't really AI. Everything else that's remaining um, is AI. So it's sort of that gap that always exists. And so in that sense, I don't know if we would ever kind of meet that. Um, AI are all the things we can't do today. <laughs> you're, you're not going to give me a number then? I'm not. <laughs> I can't force a range out of your range of numbers? N no, no. 
I mean, I think it's, these predictions have been made a lot. And well, okay. Will it actually ever happen sometime? That's not a number, just ever or never? I mean, it, I think you have to define it as more than just saying human level intelligence. Like if you're talking about specific tasks and specific domains, and if there's a way of defining it, then I think, I think yeah, I think then it could happen in those narrow domains. Um, if it's sort of a very general thing, I don't know how to, how to capture that. But even if we find it hard to define, are machines ever going to be smarter than us? I don't even know how to measure that, but if you're going to insist, I would say that I don't see a reason why not. Oh, at last, I've got an answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can move on to Thomas now. Please okay, give me a so, number. So I think already, many years ago, AI has become smarter than humans in specific tasks. So in my own work, you know, kidney exchange, we run the nationwide kidney exchange for the U.S. with our AI software, and uh, uh, it's making much better decisions than any human could. Another is sourcing auctions. So we've uh, filled $60 billion of sourcing auctions where AI is sourcing much better than any human could. Uh, and now in strategic reasoning, starting this January, AI has surpassed human reasoning when you look at incomplete information games. So uh, in poker. many, many, let's, many let's, let's of these... Let's be specific for the audience. <laughs> poker you're talking about here. What? Let's be specific for the audience. Let's be nice and, and, and concrete for the audience. You're talking now about poker. No, I'm, I'm, I'm specifically not talking about poker. I'm, I'm talking about... So we're not, we're not better than humans yet at... Machines are not better than humans yet at poker. No, I, I, at, po at, uh, at poker, heads up no limit Texas Hold'em, but also the technology is not poker technology at all. It's for general application independent solving of imperfect so, information so, games. So, so, so let's keep the tech, tech words out of it. Let's give people some more concrete examples of what you mean. If it's not poker, what sort of other applications are you talking about here? Uh, what, uh, where this technology could be applied. Well, well where this, these strategic incomplete information games. But I'm trying to avoid strategic incomplete information. Give people examples that they can grasp that if well, relate to their everyday life. I see. So uh, the general setting is for settings where you have multiple players, more than one player making decisions, and their decisions affect each other. And imperfect information means that you don't know the other guy's tasks or their capabilities or their goals and so forth. And uh, where this type of thing can be applied, automated negotiation, for example, political campaign spending, cybersecurity applications of various sorts, even medical treatment planning where you make sequential plans as to first you do this and then you measure something and based on that you do that or that or the other thing and, and, and so forth. So, the, so these are, the, it's a fairly broad class of applications where it applies, actually very broad. And that's why in the AI community we had a benchmark which where we benchmark across years and across different research groups progress in this field and the benchmark was called Heads Up No Limit Texas Hold'em Poker. So everybody was really testing their algorithms on that, although they weren't algorithms for poker. But you shouldn't play online poker against a computer bot. Yeah, I, I actually find it unethical to pretend to be human if you're not. Uh, so, so we actually don't put our AIs playing poker o on the net. So there are AIs poker, playing poker on the net and you might actually run into one by accident if you play on poker sites, but you will not run into our AI there. <laughs> so you said that we are in some sense better than humans already if we pick a very narrow focus task. That's it. Right? So, so but, but of course, like, we're humans, we much, have much broader abilities, we're much more flexible, adaptable, yeah. less brittle. So what are, what are the real open challenges that we need to solve to be able to start approaching human capabilities? So, so to me, the goal is not to start approaching human capabilities for two reasons. One is uh, the kind of saw hammer metaphor that I use. That, you know, there's a great use for a saw, right? And there's a great use for a hammer. They're both tools. But there's no demand for a saw hammer. And uh, the same thing with different AI applications. So uh, the AI, are, it's a bunch of tools, and there's really very little demand to build anything that does everything. What, what, what if I want to put yeah, a so robot, so up, let me finish robot that. up in space? L l let me finish that thought. So, so because there's no uh, demand for building AI, an AI that's like a human that will do everything, uh, it won't happen. And 
it's more about building superhuman capabilities in these specific applications where AI can be really helpful. And that's the second part of why I don't think our goal is to be like humans, in that humans are just a milestone along the way. And we blow past that milestone in many applications, and it's already happened in many, several applications. So, so that's not a stopping point, that's just a milestone along the way. So Thomas, I can't agree with you. Okay, so good. What, what, what about if we want to send a robot up to explore Jupiter? We want it to be fully capable. We want it to be able to, because the radio signal takes too long. Um, it's too inhospitable to put humans on that place. And yet we want them to be able to you know, repair the spacecraft when it, when it breaks and, and do interesting things with whatever interesting things it flies on the ground, like a human would. I mean, that's why NASA spends so much money sending expensive, difficult, delicate humans yeah, but, but let's, let's take that even, which is a very specific kind of application, by the way, which isn't real but, uh, today. But uh, take, take that. So that thing that we would send out there, which would want to have a lot of generality, I agree, but still a lot of things that humans do, it wouldn't have to do. Like it wouldn't have to speak to anybody because there's nobody to talk to. Uh, furthermore, it wouldn't have to be just as good as humans. Those things that it would actually need to do, it could be much faster, like it could actually run at 50 miles per hour, while the fastest human goes at 30. So, Devi, what do you think? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, that that still sounds kind of specific. They don't have to cook, and they don't have to deal with social interactions and social context, and it still seems like there's a lot that humans do that this robot in Jupiter, on Jupiter, wouldn't have okay, to. Okay, I, I could introduce some yeah. social dimensions to this. I mean, I suppose we want to send a... We, we, we decide we're going to do interstellar space. We're going to go and explore other stars. So... We send a capable robot, put all the humans on board the spacecraft to, to sleep, but that's, you know, that machine is going to now have to interact with us when we get to the stars, and it's going to be our guardian and our assistant through that long journey. I mean, even that and Hopefully it will cook like for us. We don't want to have to cook when we're off exploring, <laughs> exploring space. Yeah, that, that still seems like it would be in a very narrow scope of interactions for a particular task. Um, as opposed to sort of the more general relationships and interactions. I might, I might get quite people. lonely in space all on my own if I didn't have a nice <laughs> robot to talk to. I mean, you have other humans around you, right? So well, I maybe, mean, maybe they could play poker. You don't have to <laughs> talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I said we'll have a few questions. I hope, that's, I hope you've been warmed up now and um, have some feeling for how optimistic or pessimistic we are in the different parts of the panel. So let's start taking some questions from the audience. Um, thanks for coming to Melbourne. It's great to have you guys here. Um, my question is about when you have a narrow um, uh, AI that is capable of doing one particular task, how easy it, is it then to translate that knowledge to um, another AI that is uh, capable of doing a different set of tasks? So, transfer learning. Anyone want to have a go? Uh, I guess uh, I'm not going to really talk about transfer learning, but what we oftentimes do in the AI community, we build these domain-independent techniques, like tree search, which applies to basically all optimization problems or constraint satisfaction problems. Yeah, there are variants of certain techniques apply better to certain things, but we, we typically don't want to build techniques that are for a specific application, but for these application classes that, does, that are as broad as possible. So you can take, let's say, uh, a search algorithm and search software, and it applies to a bunch of different optimization settings. And the same in machine learning. The core algorithms really are rarely application specific. So it doesn't really take much to move the algorithm from application to application. And there's actually a big emphasis in the academic world to try to make things as general as possible. And there's this trade-off about pushing the generality versus actually getting, for example, computational efficiency. Right, so I think the algorithms that you would use to train each one of these um, sort of narrow AI systems would, in a lot of cases, would be general. But once you've already trained one system to do one thing, if now without retraining it, if you want to do something else, that's really hard to do. And I think that's still an open problem, especially if you you're maybe you're willing to retrain it for this other task, but you don't have a lot of data for the new task, then these systems aren't very good at being able to deal with things like that, which humans, by the way, can still do much, much better than AI can. Yes, I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, that's one of the things that we have still an immense edge over the machines. You take AlphaGo, which was this Go program that 
was able to play now superhuman Go, better than any human. But you say to AlphaGo, take that code, take the learning it's done and say, okay, let's start playing chess. It would have to start pretty much from scratch to learn how to play chess. I mean, you would use the same algorithm that AlphaGo used, maybe. You could try and use the same algorithm um, that AlphaGo used to, to learn how to play Go, and it played billions of games of Go against itself to get there. But that knowledge it required could not be used now to start playing chess. And that's something that we humans, right. can once we can play one strategic board game, We've already got a, we may not be expert players at the new game, but we'll at least have the rudimentary beginnings of expertise, of, of some capability at, at that new game. Mm. Or, or even in certain video games where, let's say you've learned to play a video game, you've spent hours at it, you're really good at it, and now, I don't know if there are monsters and other things involved, if I change the color of the monster, that's not going to throw you off, you're still going to be able to deal with it just as well. But a lot of these algorithms right now that look at these video games, they look at the appearance of what things look like. And so if you change the color of the monster, the shape of the monsters, they'll be thrown off. Or let's say if you've been used to playing the game to, um, let's say, maximize the number of points that you get along the way. And now if I tell you that, no, your goal is not to get as many points as you can. Your goal is just to get through the level as fast as you can. Don't worry about how many points you're making along the way. You'll be able to adapt to that fairly quickly. You won't have to start from scratch. But a lot of the algorithms today, if you change the goal on them, they're going to have to start from scratch and spend as many hours as they spent learning the first thing as they would have to on the second. Is that just not a failing of the humans who programmed it to only do one thing because they couldn't imagine it doing more than one thing? I mean, I think it's a failing of the humans to the extent that humans haven't figured out how to make these algorithms be general. So, I mean, it's an open research problem and the smartest humans in the world in this space right now don't know how to get it to be general. So it's a failing of the but, humans to that extent. Yeah, but also, but not. they only have one goal. The machine learning algorithm has a goal to maximize this score. Right, that score but, I mean, but I think it's... That's how we know how to do machine learning right yes, now, which yes, is why but, that's but, what we do. If we knew how to have it be general, but it can adapt to these goals, I think we would want to do it. So it's yeah, not that... The, the algorithm only has one goal. It's not the way we, we have algorithms right, that but I think two the, goals at the right, same time. But I think the question is, it does it have one goal because we as researchers couldn't, didn't realize that it would be nice for it to have more than one goal, or that we just don't know how to get it to have more than one goal and still be so, equally so good so at just, both? Just right? bring the conversation down to more concrete things. So let's, let's talk about chess and killer chess. It's a killer chess is when you have to lose your king as fast as possible, as opposed to... And is it fair to say if we took any chess-playing algorithm and said, okay, let's start playing killer chess, it would still be pretty much back to square zero? I would think so. So, I mean, that's how focused they are on solving one problem. Yeah, let's but that, by definition, is then a robot that does a rote task as opposed to an AI that uses a logical pattern to solve any problem that's presented to it. If you taught it the many patterns of that single algorithm, for example, really simple linear equation, y equals mx plus c, can come in many different formats. Why not give it a function to treat everything that's thrown at it using that format, understanding that it comes in many variables that would be more of an AI because even a human can't do that very well, where a robot just knows to do A, B, A, B, A, B, because it's done A, B a thousand times over. So uh, I think it's worth talking about how the programs we do do learn do generalize. They don't just solve the one task we teach them to. Yeah, so, so definitely. Uh, this is something that actually is not a necessary condition for something to be AI, for it to be learning. Oftentimes when I run into people, they said, okay, well, it becomes AI at the point where it starts to learn, but that's not the case. I mean, a, a lot of AI systems don't have learning in them. But also, conversely, a lot of thing, people think, uh, laymen think that AI cannot learn, and that the moment AI starts to be self-learning, that's going to be end of mankind. That's, uh, so machine learning goes back many decades. So there are learning AI systems that are very sophisticated and looks like we're still around. And uh, what about this objection people often put up, where the program only does what it's programmed to do? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, it's, uh, I, I don't really... There, there's no weight to that. So it is true, yeah, programs only do what they're programmed to do, but uh, what they're programmed to do can be something very general that humans can't even understand. So uh, the poker example. So uh, we told it to figure out 
a great strategy for poker. And we programmed it, an, uh, programmed it an algorithm to figure out a great strategy for poker. And it figured out a superhuman strategy for poker. But we didn't program in the strategy. The strategy is 50 terabytes of probabilities. I can't even understand what it is. So uh, it, 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 that, 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 that's an example where, yeah, we, it only did what we programmed it to do, but we, what we programmed was, in some sense, conceptually so much simpler than what the output was that that kind of criticism doesn't really bite. And presumably it quickly beats you at poker now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, another way to look at that same question is to say... Oh, uh, let, let yeah, me actually no, tell, tell, you, tell you an uh, anecdote. So, uh, when we were doing this man-machine match where we uh, took on four of the top ten players in poker uh, this January... Remind us of the prize. With the prize, uh, we just paid them a participation fee of 200,000. And, and then we divided it based on the, the, among them based on how well they did. But they were really fighting for the pride of mankind, which was a much bigger incentive for them. Which they lost. Which they lost. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, Thanks, Thomas. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the press was really asking, you know, are we somehow tweaking the AI behind the scenes? Like, is the power coming from us tweaking the AI? And I took it as a huge compliment <laughs> that they would actually think that I could take the world's best poker playing program and actually manually tweak it somehow to make it better. Uh -huh. So, can you tell me, Debbie, when you've been surprised or by what your programs have done? Um, I mean, it's hard to say. I think one element of surprise, so my, I've done some research and my background is in computer vision where we try and build algorithms that can understand what's in an image or a video automatically. And more recently, I've been working at the intersection of computer vision and natural language processing. And so one task that we've looked at there is if there's an image and someone asks a question about this image, you want to build a system that can answer it automatically and accurately. So give us a concrete example. So for example, if I take a picture of this room and I say, how many people are there? How many empty seats are there? Um, what color is the wall at the back of the room? And questions like that. And what we did was we collected this data set that had this kind of a data and we sort of used some generic algorithms that existed on it. And it's surprising um, how reasonable some of these responses are. And so even, even if you have a system that's not really, not really understanding, and I, I, we'd have to talk about how to define something like that, but it's not doing any complex reasoning, it's not looking at symbols, it's just looking at sort of superficial correlations that it's picked up from examples that it's seen before, and trying to generalize that to new data that it sees. And it's very reasonable sounding. And so I think, I think um, this realization that it's hard to really get a sense for when something really understands something versus when it's just picking up on correlations and generalizing that. And so it sounds like it knows what it's talking about when you know that it really doesn't. I think um, the there's, a, there's a much more depressing <laughs> conclusion, alternative conclusion, which is that our intelligence is just spurious correlations. No, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I think that would be too much of a leap. In this case, we know the data set that we've collected. We know it's in a fairly constrained domain. We know the kinds of questions that people have asked are somewhat limited. So it's, I think it's more, um, it's more that. It's more that it's a narrow domain. And in that narrow domain, it can sound reasonable. But the minute you take it out of that, if you take, so these pictures are, are pictures from Flickr. So they're high quality pictures. And if I instead take a picture with my cell phone and try to ask it questions, it's just completely off. So the minute you try and go out of its comfort zone, you realize how bad it is at this task. But as long as you keep it in its comfort zone, it sounds very reasonable. And so I think that was something that was surprising. I hadn't expected that to work as well as it did, given how simplistic the approach was. But anyway, any rate, we're still building systems that are very brittle. Right. Um, an okay. Another example is we recently um, had some work where we were trying to train two agents to negotiate over a set of items. And so there's a pool of, let's say, five books and four hats and three balls. And there are two sides. Um, I, let's say, like books more than I like hats, more than I like uh, the, the balls, and somebody else has some other order in which they prefer wait, wait, these. Wait, this is this famous fake news, right? It is. This is, um, this is the one that you all read about, <laughs> where the bots started talking their own language, and then so we, we can get the real 
truth from the source here and we don't have to <laughs> listen to any fake news right and it wasn't right. the machines starting to take over and speak was, their own language was, tell was, us no. tell us please at least. <laughs> um it, so that was not the the, sur the surprising part was just that we could we train these agents to be able to negotiate over these items and then you can have them uh, talk to humans you can pair one of these bots up with a human and the bot actually s sort of did quite well in terms of negotiating with the human and trying to get the items that it wanted and things like that and so that for example was something that was surprising i wouldn't have expected expected that to work. Um, so coming back to the, the fake news, so it, I mean, I don't even know where to start. It was, <laughs> it, it, it Don't read everything you, don't believe everything you read in the papers, yeah, first of all, it's first place to start. Yeah, and I mean, so all um, that had happened was there were these two agents that we were training to negotiate with each other, and our intent was for this bot to be able to later interact with a human and negotiate with a human. Um, but when you have these two bots negotiating, so we were using neural networks, and what neural networks are known for is that they learn their own representations that are that are better at a particular task than if a human were to hand design them, right? So going back to what you were saying earlier, that instead of humans hand designing a strategy, if you write a piece of code that finds its own strategy that works well, it's going to do better at the task, and that's what a lot of these deep neural networks are good at. They find their own strategies, their own representations that can work well, and so that's what they're designed to do, and so that's what it did. It found its own representation so that it could negotiate really well with a bot. But a lot of these strategies are not human interpretable. Like you were saying, you can't look at the strategy that the poker player has learned and understand what it's doing. The same way, this was a neural network, so you can't always understand what negotiating strategy it's using. And that's not a problem as long as it's two bots negotiating. But then if a human wants to negotiate with them, it's not OK for it to have its own representation. It needs to speak in English. So when these two neural networks found their own representation, which is what, again, they're designed to do, um, we decided that wasn't good enough. We need them to be speaking in English. So we changed. Or your favorite human language. Or your favorite, yeah, any natural language. In this case, it was English. Um, and so we changed some parameters about in that algorithm so that it can stick to a natural language. And that change that we made to the piece of code is what everyone was calling, oh, they had to shut the AI down because it discovered its own language. And so there was a joke that someone was making that it's, it's like anytime someone closes a file, um, you might say, oh, you shut something down. <laughs> When so we, nothing to nothing worry happened. about. Yeah, nothing happened. Yeah, nothing happened. We've got a question from oh, the Facebook great. Live. Great. From Matthew Keel, who uh, says, the talk last night was about jobs transition. They talked a lot about high school jobs transition and that new jobs will be created as they always are. What are the sorts of new jobs that will be created for low skills workers? For what? Low for skilled low skilled workers. workers. Okay, who's going who's to propose some jobs of the future for low-skilled people? Well, uh, while you guys think about that, I'll, I'll just uh, avert it and I uh, say something about the kidney exchange, which is that that's an example where AI really has just created jobs. So without this AI, or with this AI, now more transplants are happening, so you need more transplant surgeons, anesthesiologists, nurse team teams, hospital teams, transplant coordinators, and the whole people who run the exchange itself. So these, these are large numbers of jobs that didn't even exist. Uh, as well as keeping people alive. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> that's the main benefit, is that the people who actually get the kidneys, it's really nice to be alive. But, uh, uh, and it's good, good for society also. They're not on dialysis, which is super expensive, rather than they are in the productive workforce. But um, uh, just the employment aspect of that. So we often hear, hear about, oh, AI might actually cause jobs to be lost. And that's true. There are some jobs that might be lost. But also the other way around, you know, AI is create, uh, going to create all new kinds of jobs. And the kid kidney exchange is already an example which, where that's been happening for seven years. Well, I'll, I'll throw my opinion in, which is I do think we should be concerned about these people um, and that education is going to be increasingly important and, and that there will be some sectors of the population that will be very disadvantaged by the changes um, and that we should be concerned about this. And that's why there needs to be a serious debate about things like universal basic income uh, or negative tax rates or whatever, whatever your favorite solution is to the fact that some people might be rather underemployed and possibly even unemployable in the, with their current skill set and how we can actually assist those people to get new skills um, because, for example, driving a car is not something that we may be paying people to do for much longer because it's far cheaper, far safer, 
to let machines do that. And I don't think we, we, we need to really face up to those consequences. Um, there are immense benefits, like the ones that Thomas was talking about, um, to, to many parts. But it's not clear that all of us are going to benefit and therefore how we share the prosperity that comes. I think um, this might not be so much in the longer term, but maybe in the near term as AI gets better, I think there might be scenarios where AI is is sort of it's becoming good enough where it is useful to use it, but it's not perfect, so you still need human involvement, which when there is no AI at all, there isn't that human involvement is not required either. So for example, if you think about um, these apps that try and aid blind users, visually impaired users, when those don't even exist, there's just sort of, they don't exist. There is no aid, there's nothing to be done. But now there are these apps that are becoming better and better where they are useful. So in a lot of cases, these users can just use them, but they're still not perfect. So every so often there needs to be a human in the loop who's involved in answering these questions for them. So if they take a picture of their oven and say, what temperature is the stove set to? And if the AI can respond, it'll go ahead and respond. But if it can't figure it out, it might ship that off to a human who can look at that picture and respond by in terms of what that temperature is. Uh, and so that might be an example of a low skill. It's just just you as a human can recognize images, so there's no sort of additional skills involved. And that's a position that's opening up because there is an imperfect AI that needs a human in the loop. So again, I'm, it's not a longer term thing, but still in the shorter term, it might be something. And I'm not convinced that's a very large number of jobs. So pe 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 scale, people have yeah. said that, for example, driving, truck driving, there are all these edge cases, difficult conditions. You're driving along the road, the highway, and a, you come across some roadworks, and the truck can't work out what's going on. It's not on its uh, GPS. Uh, there's a person signaling, and it can't see what the signals are, it can't recognize the signals. And so a very likely scenario is, is that we'll actually have um, the trucks switch to remote control, and there'll be a, a control center that coordinates all the trucks around the country, and there'll be backup drivers, backup human drivers, who will be sitting in virtual cabs back in this control center, who will be able to then take over the truck, drive it safely through the, through the roadworks, and then when it's out the other side, it will switch back on into fully autonomous, driverless driving. You won't need many of those people depending on how often the truck has to give up. You know, one hour in a hundred, you'll need one hundredth of the drivers just to be able to service those. Those drivers will serve many, many trucks. So that will create a few n number of driving jobs, but many more will have dis disappeared. Okay, um, more questions? My question is that it was mentioned earlier that could AIs become better than humans? Yes. My question is, how could AIs become better than humans if, even if all of humanity's knowledge is poured, made into those machines, um, wouldn't the AI's limits be um, humanity's knowledge? So th thank you for coming and thank you for asking a really good question. So, Thomas, how do you build a poker bot that's better than all the poker knowledge in the planet? Oh, okay. My, one of my favorite topics. <laughs> so, so, so in some sense, uh, people think that people are great. And, and, and the way, my, my, my own experience, the first time I saw and, uh, the opposite was when, when I was in college, I programmed an uh, AI program to play Othello, and it beat me. <laughs> and that was, that was really just a little project in a class, but that was really, for me, the eye-opening moment. That, that I saw that you know something that you have built can be smarter than you, and that that's not a contradiction in any way. But a lot of people think about that there's something that's something there's something wrong with that 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 can't be, but it absolutely can be. And uh, another way to th uh, think about the humankind in a more humble way is that you know we always think about humans as a benchmark of intelligence, but let's say that some space alien comes here, look at, uh, looks at our planet and says, okay, well, these guys are just a little bit above ants. Uh, so so, so I, uh, you know, the human benchmark is not always very high. And when especially you get to this, these very complicated, uh, complicated tasks, uh, intellectually complicated tasks that include a lot of contingent action, a lot of sequential planning, these types of things, or a lot of combina uh, combinations that you have to get just right, 
that's when the humans end up doing really poorly. So that, that's what the machines are really good at. So in, in, in poker, yeah, that's one example like that. You have to think about the incomplete information and what you do now and plan, plan ahead and think about what the other players' actions tell you about their private information and what do your actions tell to them about your private information. And that is just very complex for humans to do. Um, so so what, what we do, we write software that, uh, that's basically an algorithm. It's, a, it's like a recipe, if you like. Uh, this is how you make a cake, or this is how you make a strategy for poker. But I don't actually know how to make the strategy for poker. I only know how to write the recipe to make the strategy for poker. And then I give the strategy, the, the recipe, to a supercomputer, and the supercomputer just uh, runs the recipe really carefully a lot of the time, and then it outputs the cake, or it outputs the strategy for poker. So, to I mean, Thomas, one of the great things about poker is you can play, the computer can play itself. Yes. Right, so it can play itself billions of times, more times of, you can play more games of poker than any human could in the whole lifetime. And so, the, this, get the, better from learning by playing against itself. Yes, this is, this is actually different than how uh, the AlphaGo people went about solving Go. So when we went against the best humans in poker, that AI had never played a hand of poker against any human or against any other AI. And, and you, so, hadn't, so, so it's, you hadn't poured in, in the knowledge were, of poker yeah, playing it, books? It, it, it had no, 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 uh, no information from the humankind's knowledge of how to play poker. Humans have been playing poker for hundreds of years, uh, millions of hands, well, uh, lots more than that. But, and uh, books have been written, and there's this whole human knowledge of how poker should be played. And we just uh, took the exact opposite approach of that. We said, okay, that knowledge is wildly incomplete, and there's a lot of things that are wrong in that knowledge, so we're not going to even look at that. We are going to automatically have the, the algorithm create the strategy for poker. And so that is very distasteful for the poker players to say, okay, we're going to come here, we're going to shadow box against ourselves against the mirror, and then we're going to step in the ring with Mike Tyson and see what happens. And, and that, that, that is not sitting well with the humans. They thought that, you know, didn't you have any poker experts on your team? And we're like, no. And if I could afford one more person on the team, I still wouldn't hire a poker expert. I would hire one more AI uh, programmer. So, uh, so yeah, so, so you can actually, just from the rules of the game, you can figure out a good strategy for it, so much so that it's better than all of the poker knowledge that humankind has been put to, putting together over hundreds of years. I'm just wondering if that can be reversed and when a computer has worked out the best strategy or the most perfect, if that's possible, then that can teach, be the teachers in schools, or that can teach us things that we want to be good at or... Um, yeah, that, that's a great question and the answer, short answer is yes, but let me uh, go into that in a little bit more detail. So, in general, whether that can be done with an AI technique, it depends on the technique. So a classic example where it cannot be done with today's techniques is deep learning or neural networks. There it ends up being completely non-transparent. So wh whatever you learn, you cannot look at and understand. Uh, uh, in the poker, it's kind of yes and no, in that the strategy is probabilities in every situation. So you can say, yes, if I want to know in this particular situation, what should I do? Yes, you can answer that question exactly. But the lookup table of all those probabilities is 50 terabytes. So it's too big for a human to memorize or to look at all at once. So uh, there's a question, can you somehow compress that without uh, then uh, make it more human understandable without losing too much of play quality? But of course, there's this trade-off between quality of play and human understandability. There's, think, a, there's also, go on, go on. I was going to say that I think even in cases where, for example, if you have these deep models where you get, it's hard to interpret what the system has learned, I think even then, just by watching what the machine chooses to do, humans can learn from it. And I think with AlphaGo, there was this uh, story that people told that Lisa Dahl, who was the human expert that AlphaGo had beat, 
other players who've played against Lisa, Lisa Doll in the past, after they played against him, after the match that Lisa Doll had with AlphaGo, they actually commented saying that Lisa Doll's strategies have changed and he's become a better player because of his experience with playing AlphaGo. And so that's one example where even if you can't write down exactly what the strategy is that the machine was using, just through interactions, and especially an expert can maybe pick some things up that they wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I was going to actually, uh, thank you for reminding me, the same thing in poker. So, uh, so we know that there are wrong things about the poker books. So for example, they say that you should never use an action called limping. Well, our AIs limp between 8 and 12% of the time. You should never donk bet. We, our AIs do that. So it, uh, they really show that the, what, what mankind has learned isn't actually right. It's like, okay, well, there's rumors that you shouldn't do it, and everybody kind of evolved to not do it, and then it became folk wisdom that you shouldn't do it. But this has really um, started from ground up instead of being, you know, these guys read the books and then wrote some more books and played some poker the same way humans always did. Uh, there's, there's no bias towards the status quo. It just starts from scratch. It's like a Martian coming here and said, okay, oh, you played this game, let me see. But th Thomas, before people get too worried, right, I'm, I don't know what a dog bet is, but neither does Libratus, your program. That's your interpretation. It's still, we still don't write programs that can generate concepts like dog bet what, well, whatever okay. that is. Okay, okay. so let, let, let's talk about the concept. So I, ac I would actually think about the other way around. Uh, so, so the AI actually figures out millions of new things to do. And for some of them, we have names, like limping or donk betting. And then we said, ah, this thing limps, while the books say you shouldn't. But it also does millions of other things that people don't even have names for. Whether you want to call them concepts or not, we can we can debate whether it's a smart but, thing but to but use a dog the bet word, is, but a, a dog bet is, a, I, I, I suppose, because I know so little about it. But I'm human, so I can bluff. <laughs> AIs that, can bluff. <laughs> you have to bluff to play poker well. Uh, is a, a generalization of a whole class of different moves that the program makes. Yes, it collects. It, yes, it, it notices that there is. You notice it, it doesn't actually do those sorts of generalizations. It doesn't need to play so well. But if you want to explain well, then you take all these different moves and say, oh, they're all of the same form about, you know, betting high and then throwing whatever it is, whatever it is right? Yeah. So, so, so uh, in short, what a donk bet is, is if, the, if you've shown weakness on the previous betting round, now you get some more uh, cards and it's now your turn to move first, you bet and so, uh, show strength. I mean, clearly, you might actually be strong now, given that you've got the new cards. But that's strategically considered to be a bad thing. But turns out it's not. It's uh, certain situations you want to do that. But the trickiness is really what are those situations? And the AI figured those out. So you've learned one thing today about how to improve your poker. <laughs> OK, more questions. One of the topics that was covered last night was the idea that, last night, not before, was the idea that um, we should never put the uh, choice to to take a human life in the hands of a machine. Um, and the question, I guess, is, and kind of with your example of uh, machine drivers uh, moving people around, that sort of thing, at what level of sentience or what level of problem solving do we actually uh, think that it's acceptable to put that decision in the hands of a machine? Um, and I guess as a corollary, uh, what sort of ethics would you put into a machine that's driving people around? Um, you know, uh, all of the trolley problem whereby you've got a choice between killing one person and killing many. So, let me try and paraphrase. At what level of uh, capability do we have to make autonomous cars before we can leave them responsibly driving on the roads? Do they have to be as good as humans, ten times better than humans, hundred times? How do, we, how do we solve these difficult moral questions? So, so let, me, let me first pick up on the, the, uh, your question directly, which is that I think it's way too coarse to say that AI should not make life and death decisions over humans. I mean, we're seeing in the kidney exchange that it's absolutely necessary for that to happen. The AI is making those life and death decisions two times a week for 159 transplant centers together. 69% uh, of all the transplant centers in the US. So uh, if a human tried to do that, that would literally be ki uh, killing people because it would make, be making decisions that are worse. 
So then, so, so, so this. But, but there's a slight asymmetry there. You're talking about decisions that can actually save people's well, well, lives. I'll, I'll come to that. As opposed come to, to kill that. people. With an autonomous car, you're either yeah, not yeah, killing people but, but, or but, killing but, people. But, 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 I'll come to that. So, there's so, no lives being saved in autonomous cars. So, so it, it's a subtle thing. You know, uh, what, what is the delta compared to? So if we're saving more lives than the default, uh, then I guess we're killing less lives than, than the default would ki kill. That's so a it's very mathematical it, 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 answer. It, it, it's, just a, it's just a way of phrasing it, whether you're saying you're saving this many lives or you're killing fewer people. So, uh, so, so, so I think, but in weapons, I think it's a totally different thing. Uh, the, the, there, uh, I, uh, I, I'm more okay with that type of thinking, but in general, the idea that it's somehow demeaning to mankind that AI makes life and death decisions to, uh, or about humans, I think that's completely wrong. So, trolley problems. We haven't addressed the trolley problem part of the question. Yeah, uh, le let me leave the trolley problem to other people. <laughs> <laughs> you coward, you. <laughs> Devi, can you help us out with the trolley problem? <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm going to have anything uh, more to say that either. I, like when you were saying that how do we solve some of these problems, I don't know if sort of a bunch of computer scientists can even figure that out. I think we need a more broader conversation with lawyers and sociologists and all sorts of other things. Um, to be able to say, so I don't, I don't feel like I'm no, equipped I, to be able I, to comment I, on something like that. I, I'm yeah. going to agree with you 100%. This is a conversation not for, for the three of us. It's the conversation for the whole of society. That's yeah. This is the values that we as society have to decide on. And I think the trolley problem is actually a, 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 a pretty irrelevance uh, from what we really need to think about. But it's very interesting that um, we're starting to wake up with this nice little toy example to the fact that we are going to have to make these sorts of decisions. It's not going to be just trolley problems. It's going to be um, um, many, many other much more common aspects of our lives. I do know people who build autonomous cars and they all assure me there's nothing at all in the code they write to do with trolley problems. There's no subroutine that says, okay, now branch off and decide, drive into the pedestrian, drive into the brick wall. Um, and work out the probabilities and then work which, which branch to go down. There's nothing, the car has so little understanding of its actions and its position in the world that how it solves a problem, trolley problem is only indirectly through the high level of decisions it's making about uh, what it's doing. It's, it's not aware enough of the world really to, it has no idea it's solving a trolley problem. And it's such an obscure thing but it does, I think, illustrate how philosophy and ethics are going to become much more important and we'll have to work out, as a society, what, what we need machines to do in these sorts of situations and, and not just obscure ones like trolley problems. Okay, um, more questions. Uh, my question is, um, if we have this uh, POCO expert, the AI POCO expert, uh, whether it is possible to develop this when, uh, accounting AI expert who will do the accounting or this, uh, say, um, uh, some of the uh, stuff we do it, um, like um, a teacher expert, AI expert, or um, other areas expert. Uh, if it is possible, then the, my question is, um, can I tomorrow um, suggest to my uh, CEO that uh, you can hire an AI expert and uh, train them all the accounting logics and how the accounting work and retrench all the juniors, the, the stuff they do it, and save the, uh, the salary expenses and make it this organization more profitable? Yeah, I think that really depends on the area, uh, w whether that's possible and, and whether that's possible tomorrow. Uh, the, I, the way I think about AI in industry, where the benefits come from, one is that, uh, labor savings. So, so, okay, can I replace somebody? Can I fire somebody? Can I avoid hiring, blah, blah, blah? Can I replace somebody expensive with somebody cheap? That's kind of one. The whole other side is just better decision making, not just faster and cheaper decision making, but better decision making. And we're seeing that in the kidney exchange and in the sourcing auctions and so on. And that leads to an overall efficiency increase. So I, I, I think that AI so far has mostly been fielded from a kind of a labor savings perspective, replacing road tasks, not b uh, big time decision making tasks or things like that so much, although it has been applied there too. But I think over time, it's probably going to shift a little bit more to the higher end that way. But, but, but even the labor saving side of, of, of AI's change to our, our work, work lives, you can, do, you can just say, okay, we're just going to put those people out of work now. And I think that's the very short-sighted way to, to, 
to take advantage of the productivity that the machine's giving you. The more long-sighted way is to say, okay, well, we can take the, the, the time of those people now and use it for them to speak to the customer, find out what the customer really wants, to improve the product or improve the service, to do, to, to do more interesting things, actually, than, than sitting in front of the machine, you know, sitting in front of the conveyor belt, um, you know, screwing nuts on, but actually do um, things that will improve the product or the service or the customer uh, experience um, and lift the game as opposed to just save money. What is the minimum investment for implementing one AI expert in my accounting department if I say it is possible? Could you give me any figure? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. What is the minimum investment that minimum I Minimum investment? Yes. Oh, oh and I, I think that the, the question was what is the minimum investment in an AI expert that can do that? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's not a one person job. I mean, these things, uh, to build sophisticated AI, these are huge investments. Of and we're not cheap. O over many years. And, we're not cheap. And, and AI people are some of the most sought after people right now. But, so, so it's not cheap. But you have to do it once and then you can. Yeah, that, that's, a, that, many, that's a thing that it's highly companies. leveraged. Yes. But, but I thought what you're asking about. Um, investing in AI experts, or are you talking about investing in a machine that is just doing the accounting? Yeah, well, so that's, I mean, that's one of the challenges. The machines are getting much cheaper. You can buy an industrial robot like Baxter for $20,000 now. They used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that's making one reason why the technology is turning up in more and more places, not only because of the capability, but because the, some of the robots and things are becoming much cheaper. And, and when it's just a soft bot, then it, it's almost free. Right, we have time for one more question. So I pref prefer someone who hasn't asked a question. Now is your last chance. This is the, going to be the end of the AI Lounge. We, um, the, or the, any question that's burning for you? Otherwise, I'll choose one of the people who's already asked a question. A, a question in the front? Oh, wonderful way, place to end. Someone whose future is in the balance. <laughs> um, so if you were to take AI, AI and if you taught them and set an algorithm for the AI that helped them be, I don't know, smarter, hum smarter than humans at everything, right? Would that be the better? Would it be for the better or the worse, in your opinion? Thank you, thank you. So if we if we did, I know you tr try to avoid <laughs> desperately, but now you've got got someone we have to answer <laughs> to, right? Someone who's going to inherit all of this. Would that be? I think I, I think thing? I tend to be an optimistic person, um, and I think it would overall be for the good. I think technology getting better is overall for the good. I, I, I think it depends how you use it, uh, uh, whether you use it for good or bad. But uh, if, if it's used for good, absolutely, uh, it'll be better. I, I completely agree with Thomas. The panelists aren't supposed to agree with each other, but, but we could solve cancer. We could we could solve we could solve all of the diseases that that, that plague us. We could we could um, um, there's so many aspects of our lives that could be improved if we had better decisions made. We could we could perhaps we could even solve climate change, or the Middle East, or could we replace politicians? Yes, we could have much better politics if we trusted the machines. I mean, that, that, I think that's uh, well. Actually, it's not going to be hard at all to have better politicians. I mean, we already have such excuse me rubbish politicians, but. At CMU, um, uh, we, we actually have this uh, kind of a semi-serious bet as to what will be the last year that the U.S. will have a human president. <laughs> and and, and what's the, what are the odds on the numbers these days? I, I, I don't remember. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's only half serious, but we, we do toy, about, we toy with that thought. But we're talking 50, 100, not, not 1,000 years, right? Probably not 1,000. Okay, well... Uh, we've come back to politics. I think we should finish the conversation now. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, a number of people. I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, I want to thank all of the, the panelists who have um, shared their expertise and, and their ideas with us over the course of the last week. Uh, I want to thank Melbourne Conversations and Sebastian for, for taking on this uh, activity. And I want to thank Cargo Hall for providing such a, a wonderful uh, place to host this conversation. And I hope you've um, learned something. I hope it's been um, made you think about these things. Uh, I encourage you to follow those ideas. There's, there's lots of uh, places you can find more information, and I'm sure we'll be having more conversations in the future. So thank you very much, and good night. <laughs>